Elite Facts presents Don't Fall for These 7 Lies Developers Made to Sell You Their Games Have you ever bought a game because of how well it was advertised, but when playing it you realize that the developer was telling a bunch of lies and laughing in your face for falling for them? Who are we kidding? We've all been ripped off by game developers at some point, but our question here is who's ripped us off the most? Before we jump into it, we need to mention that just because we're talking about shady promotional tactics used to sell these games, it doesn't mean that all of these games are bad. In fact, some of them are either critically acclaimed or just downright fun to play. With that being said, here are 7 lies developers made to sell their games. 7. Metal Gear Solid 2 – Snake is the protagonist Obviously, Metal Gear Solid 2 isn't a bad game. Hell, it's far from being a bad game. However, we simply can't overlook this misleading promotional tactic. The massively anticipated Metal Gear Solid sequel would reunite players with their favorite half-spy, half-soldier protagonist from the previous game, Solid Snake, for another exhilarating adventure. The truth of the matter, however, is that Snake was only playable for like one hour during the tanker mission at the start of the game. As soon as that opening segment is finished, he's then quickly replaced with the effeminate new recruit, Raiden, much to the disappointment of every MGS fan out there. What made fans even angrier was that beloved video game director Hideo Kojima intentionally deceived them by not only focusing mainly on the shorter tanker portion of the game in trailers, but even replacing Raiden with Snake in scenes from the main portion of the game. Though Kojima could argue that the surprise was a necessary conceit, would it really have killed him to tell us ahead of time and let us down a little more gently? Ah, uh, we can't stay mad at Kojima, he's directed too many good games. Anyway, the soul-crushing disappointment felt when players realized they'd had to play as Raiden for the next 10 to 12 hours still stings today. Although playing as Raiden in Metal Gear Rising Revengeance is a whole lot of fun. 6. Call of Duty Ghosts – True Next Gen before we get any further, we're just going to go ahead and say that the Call of Duty series isn't as bad as people make it out to be. Yeah, they recycle the game every single year, but if it ain't broke, I guess don't fix it. Although we do agree that they should try and innovate a bit more in terms of adding more multiplayer modes and maybe put a little bit more effort into writing their campaign modes, but I digress. Call of Duty Ghosts, however, stirred up a little bit of controversy. Gameplay-wise, it was perfectly fine. The story was a bit cheesy but enjoyable, and the multiplayer was fine as you'd expect. The big selling point of this game, however, is that it was the first game in the Mammoth FPS series to be released on the Wii U, PS4, and Xbox One, heralded the next-gen homecoming of the franchise, and would truly take the series to the next level of visuals and possibilities. Unfortunately, however, anyone who has played Ghosts on Xbox One and PS4 knows that it absolutely doesn't play like a new generation game. The graphics look only marginally better than the previous generation versions, and to the naked eye, there's not much evidence that it's being played on a PS4 or Xbox One over a PS3 or Xbox 360. They used murky and low-res textures, the engine at the time was widely outdated, and simply it made for a rather underwhelming debut for the series on next-gen tech, especially considering how incredible games like Black Ops 3 and WW2 look, not to mention the price hike made the purchase feel like a ripoff. It seems like the real next-gen debut for the franchise was Sledgehammer Games' Advanced Warfare, which boasts significantly better graphics and more or less set the bar for following Call of Duty games. Also, can we say that Extinction Mode was a lot of fun? No? Okay, well, moving on. 5. Dead Island – Advertised to be intelligent and emotional this one is a shame. So technically, it wasn't just the heart-wrenching trailer that sold Dead Island to us as the game that had been in production for five years before its release. However, the cinematic trailer they released falsely advertised the overall tone of the game, misleading players. Dead Island's cinematic trailer is still one of the greatest of its kind, a slow-motion heartbreaker that depicts a vacationing family's fatal encounter with a zombie horde. A masterclass in marketing, it planted expectations for a touching game about family survival. But that's not what Dead Island was. Dead Island was a buggy, cooperative shooter with surprisingly Moorish melee combat and some fairly terrible matchmaking capabilities. As negative as that description sounds, the game was actually a blast to play. Hell, the story and voice acting is such a mess that it's downright hilarious. But it certainly wasn't the tearjerker we had been led to believe. 4. Peter Molyneux 
Okay, look, I'm sure Peter Molyneux is a nice guy in person. Hell, you can see he does have a passion for the games industry. However, his approach at actually selling games is incredibly shady. The designer of the Fable franchise claimed ahead of the first game's release that, quote, if you choose to carve your initials in a tree, the initials will still be there if you come back to the tree 10 years later. Like, okay, that's not a massive thing to complain about. However, it's just indicative of Molyneux's approach to selling a game. To pull an idea out of thin air, promise it to players, and then realize that he can't actually do it. Now, as we've said, we're not saying he's a bad person. We believe that he loves the industry and what he does. He seems like a genuine person. Molyneux himself has even said sorry for all the false promises he's made. However, too many false promises has pretty much tarnished his image to the public. Take for example, with each Fable release, he would say something along the lines of, oh yeah, I think we messed up on the previous game, but this one is going to knock it out of the park. He keeps making false promises and keeps discrediting his previous work just to promote his latest title, just so he can discredit it later down the line. He's literally done that in interviews for Fable 2 and 3. You don't know what to believe with him. 3. Watch Dogs and any Ubisoft games with amazing graphics we still remember seeing the gameplay reveal for Watch Dogs back in 2012, way before next-gen consoles were unveiled. It looked absolutely beautiful. This game, however, was probably the first time we all started to notice Ubisoft's little white lies they used at Game Expos to promote their latest titles. Now, technically, a lot of developers do the whole, whoa, look at all these in-game graphics trick. However, Ubisoft kind of takes it to the next level. At the E3 2012 conference, they confirmed themselves that it would look exactly as it does on next-gen consoles. Although the retail version of Watch Dogs performed like it promised in terms of gameplay, its visuals had been severely hamstrung since the game's 2012 reveal. After several development delays, fans were shocked to find the finished product looking vastly inferior to videos that had sold them on the concept. Gone was the wind, dust, and smoke seen in the reveal, and the game's glossy, neon-tipped blacks and blues had been replaced by a murky layer of brownish-gray. To compare it, it had a very washed-out sort of look that last-generation Grand Theft Auto V had. People felt betrayed because they had gotten themselves all hyped up over what appeared to be the most groundbreaking open-world game since Grand Theft Auto III. But if Watch Dogs had been revealed via more accurate trailers, it would probably still have generated significant hype. Now, admittedly, the game didn't look bad. In fact, it looked quite nice in some aspects. However, it couldn't hold a candle up to the E3 2012 demo. It's also worth mentioning that the PC version of Watch Dogs actually had the shaders for the E3 demo locked. So there was no excuse for the PC version to look the way it did at release. This would begin a long trend of Ubisoft games that had beautiful looking demos, but would release to the public just looking all right. It's a damn shame. Two. Alien Colonial Marines. Just everything. We're still pissed about this. After many years in development and being resurrected from cancellation, Alien Colonial Marines was released to the public on February 12, 2013 to nothing but critical panning. Being developed by Gearbox Games, the guys behind Borderlands and polishing up Duke Nukem Forever for release. Yeah, those guys. The game released as an absolute mess, as it was just cobbled together with seemingly no consideration for what made the Alien franchise work in the first place. Upon release, the internet was flooded with videos showing off disgusting and embarrassing textures. Broken Enemy and Partner AI And of course, how could we forget the always hilarious dancing xenomorph glitch? That's probably the only good thing to come out of this game. And it wasn't even intentional, it was a train wreck. Now, okay, yes, it's a situation very similar to that of Duke Nukem Forever, in terms of a game being in development for several years only to be released to critical panning. However, the build of Alien Colonial Marines that was showcased at E3 2012, seven months before the game launched worldwide, was drastically different to what we ended up getting. People were pissed. For a start, the game fans bought was missing a lot of texture, shadowing, dynamic lighting, and cinematics that had been trailed at E3, and comparison videos by the likes of video gamers served as damning indictments of developers' Gearbox software. The inevitable fallout was something to behold. This incident pretty much tarnished Gearbox credibility as fans rushed to decry CEO Randy Pitchford as a liar and a con man. 
YouTube game journalist and self-proclaimed Beatles of People, Jim Sterling decided that he wasn't going to stand for these misleading tactics and launched a barrage of criticisms and investigative reports at the developer. Sterling has continued this crusade to this day and has stated that he won't stop until Gearbox CEO Randy Pitchford apologizes. Insider sources eventually revealed that significant portions of the game had been outsourced to other developers, while Gearbox shifted their workforce over to Borderlands. Gearbox has categorically denied these accusations, but have been completely unable to provide a sufficient explanation as to why the release version of Colonial Marines was so much worse than the game they had convinced people to buy. 1. No Man's Sky Ha! What else would have been number one? No Man's Lie, or I mean No Man's Sky, has gained quite the reputation over the past year, hasn't it? Okay, sure, it's been fixing a lot of major problems, and it has been including a lot of features that weren't included at launch through frequent updates, but it still doesn't excuse their promotional methods. Now, you could say we have ourselves to blame for putting the hype train into fifth gear. However, how could we not get hyped when we're told things like being able to encounter other players in this massive universe, destroy space stations and fleets, land on asteroids, the technical possibility of flying between star systems manually, planets rotating and orbiting around the sun, actual ship classes and differentiation, more natural flight characteristics, resources depending on distance from the sun, environmental factors, the ability to play the game solely as a trade or solely in space, and so on and so on and so on. Now, some of these things may sound like a bit of a nitpick, however, when you're creating an open universe game while promising these features, you're damn right people are going to get excited at all the possibilities when it comes to exploring. It's honestly a damn shame. Don't forget to like us and subscribe for more Elite Facts.